Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to Earth Week at UM. Uh, my name is Teddy Lutzelier. I'm the Sustainability Manager for UM. And so before we start with this event tonight, I'm going to go over some housekeeping rules. Uh, you'll see that the chat is disabled. It's because you can ask a question anytime during the presentation, during the discussion uh, to any panelist through the Q&A button. You have like a little Q&A button. That's where you have to, uh, to send your questions. And uh, Jamal and Martin will, uh, will ask those questions to our panelists at the end. Uh, so let me, let me go over the, the, the reason why we're here today. Uh, we're going to watch this movie called Saving Gilgamesh, which is a mini documentary from two UM grad students, very smart students, Martin Hidalgo and Jamal Wilson, that deals with the, the often neglected relationship between climate change and the loss of culture. Um, uh, those unable to adapt to the most severe impacts of a uh, extreme climate change often represent uh, cultures that date back thousands of years. Uh, so as the large scale displacement of these vulnerable uh, cultures accelerates, what perspective and methods uh, could be used to be best preserve this to best preserve these cultures? Will technology help or hinder the titanic task that lays ahead? What institution where are best suited to, to take this uh, challenge? Those are the questions that are uh, uh, asked in this documentary and that we'll discuss later on with, the, with our uh, panelists. Before I introduce our two filmmakers, uh, Jamal asked me to, uh, um, to do a, a little session of acknowledgement. So we would like to acknowledge the lands and waters now known as the state of Florida the ancestral homeland of the Calusa, Tequesta, and Miami uh, tribes. Today, the great Everglades are the unceded ancestral homeland cared for the descendants of peoples that came to be known as the Seminole tribe of Florida, the Mikosuki tribe of Indians of Florida, and the unaffiliated independent uh, or traditional Seminoles. So with that, let me start with Martin, our, um, our first uh, filmmaker. Uh, Martin is a senior student, double majoring in motion pictures and creative advertising. His works both as a filmmaker and creative strive to uh, uh, carry within uh, them the mo motive of social change. His belief is in, uh, in the power of communication, both through film and advertising, is what fuels his, his artistic expression. Coming from a philosophy background, Martin aims at simplifying complex problems into digestible content and hopefully into its attainment. Uh, previous works include The Origins of Violence and The Lesson in Humility, to which he was awarded recognition during the Montclair State University Student Symposium in 2018. Uh, the other filmmaker, uh, the co-author of this, uh, this documentary is Jamal Wilson. So Jamal is an environmental media and communications graduate student with the Lenar and Jane Avis Center for Ecosystem Science and Policy, pursuing a master's of professional science in environment, culture, and media. If you want to become a filmmaker, that's a great, uh, great, great uh, path. As an intern coordinator for environmental artist Xavier Cortada's Underwater Homeowner Association participatory art project, He's focused on bridging the gap between environmental communication, community participation, and digital media. He's also a marketing coordinator for uh, Miami Herbert Business School graduate business admissions, uh, aiding the sustainability rebranding of Miami Herbert as the school embraces the role of guiding future business leaders towards a more sustainable future. And with that, Jamal, you can start sharing your screen and you can watch this, uh, this great movie. All right, guys, thank you. Hope you enjoy. Yeah, 
Over the last 10 years, sea levels have risen at an alarming rate. Biodiversity is reportedly declining faster than that of any time in human history. And millions, millions of people have been affected by extreme weather like hurricanes and floods. Climate change. You hear it discussed in terms of its relationship with mankind's exponential technological growth. It has been discussed in terms of its relationship with ecosystems, with economies, even its relationships with political ideologies. Less spoken about is climate change's relationship with migration and how it's affecting demographic shifts already in full motion. Communities that depend on the predictability of weather patterns, such as farming communities, are silently relocating on a massive scale. What's happening at the border between Mexico and Guatemala is a great example. Tens of thousands of families, many that have depended on farming for their livelihoods for generations, are being forced to abandon their land as traditional farming methods no longer provide what they need to survive. Farming methods that are sensitive to the smallest of changes. Those unable to adapt to the most severe impacts of extreme climate change often represent cultures that date back thousands of years. As the large-scale displacement of these vulnerable communities accelerates, the importance of cultural preservation will be put to the test. How will the acceleration of climate migration impact the cultural preservation of vulnerable communities? Can technologies, such as the internet, help preserve vulnerable cultures, or will it be an obstacle to those who need the preservation the most? Expressions of identity that unite communities in the form of architecture, music, dance, language, and food tell the story of a people's relationship to the human family. Cultural anthropologists and other scientists and scholars that study this human phenomenon have done so under different names for hundreds, if not thousands of years. The observations and cataloging of cultural artifacts can be a long and arduous process involving tens of thousands of pages, hours, and interactions. As technological innovations have accelerated, so have the various methods of preserving cultural artifacts, expanding access to rich archives of cultural heritage. As climate change accelerates, which tools and methods will best serve cultures closest to the front lines of this advancing threat? How can technology and the internet be used to meet this global challenge? Today we are here in the IPCH Conservation Lab and it's a single space where everybody works together. That was the idea behind the whole concept of it. First major collaboration is with the Research Science Department of the Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage, which is literally across the corridor from this lab. Large institutions and museums are digitizing archives for eyes of global audiences, while online portals such as YouTube and Facebook are becoming treasure troves of film, and audio recordings. While technology has given cultural preservation a new global dimension, who is it really designed to benefit? It has often been said that the US, for example, is a melting pot of cultures. However, conflict theorists agree that America is closer to a multicultural society than a melting pot. The problem with the melting pot idea is that cultures do not fuse together homogeneously. Our history, our culture, our information, have all been often viewed and represented through an ethnocentric lens, prioritizing one subculture over another. What stops those who control the internet and the access of information How will this global lens impact these vulnerable cultures over the long term? If the titanic goal of cultural preservation for those most impacted takes shape, what role would it play in the larger context of culture? 
For one, it could help migrating communities reconnect with their past customs. Traditions are often linked to geography, which include the environmental characteristics of an area such as the flora and fauna. Environments not only shape perceptions of reality, but also the cultural identities of a group. As groups relocate, their cultural identity will be challenged by the more dominant culture. This could lead to a series of problems, such as difficulties for adaptation, discrimination in their newfound society, and forced assimilation. Acculturation to me is learning how to keep your culture while interacting successfully with other cultures. Whereas assimilation to me is more of the melting pot where you lose who you are in order to become more like the dominant culture. When we see kids starting to shed who they were, then we see a disconnect happening at home and that creates more social issues for the family. An important aspect of conserving cultures is the embedded knowledge of customs and traditions. Think of the stories, the religions, the history, the art, and the endless cascade of human activities that provide a small window into a universe of ideas and possibilities. Western society knows well, almost intuitively, of the importance of this fact, which can be seen in the elevation of importance of Western perspectives over all else. The urgency of cultural preservation should reflect the urgency demonstrated by the monument men in World War II, whose sole task was the transportation and security of artistic artifacts. One clear example of this embedded knowledge can be seen and heard in language. Madre y no, padre y ya, machete, hija, jojua, y sandaro a toa. Each of these languages holds a little piece of information or a lot of information, can hold information about, about medicines and health, can hold information about the constellations in the sky. And that's an information that if you lose the language, you lose that connection with that place, with that way of thinking, with tens of thousands of years. As the world rediscovers ways of living in balance with nature, ancient knowledge and tradition will begin to resurface as valuable sources. We cannot know what pieces we might need for the future, even if we think we know it all. We cannot take for granted the added knowledge of past generations and the various survival mechanisms of these communities. Who is best suited to take on this challenge? Traditionally, the archiving of cultural artifacts can take months or even years of observing and building trust with communities. Will reputations of large institutions, such as UNESCO, Smithsonian, and others, help or hinder relationships with communities most vulnerable to climate change? Do nonprofits and NGOs have the methodologies to begin to meet this titanic task? Will these institutions focus rather than really consider the perspectives of vulnerable communities? Will they organize their plan of action with the needs of vulnerable communities at the center? In the era of large and well-funded NGOs, the work has already begun. The National Trust for Historic Preservation and UNESCO's World Heritage Center have begun research initiatives to attempt to meet this need. Cultural preservation that focuses on interactions between people may prove the best way forward in the era of accelerating migrations. The internet, digital video, and social networking platforms could capture recordings of theme-based conversations between mothers, daughters, grandfathers, and grandsons, giving a substantial insight into the culture, language, and dynamics of communities vulnerable to sudden changes in their ecosystems. Emphasizing these connections and the artifacts and rituals that are central to culture could give us the most complete representation and preservation that benefits both vulnerable communities and the globe as a whole.
Mr. Martin. That was a beautiful of art, a beautiful documentary. And now we're going to open the dialogue with our panelists. Uh, so Jamal, if you want to take it away. Sure. Um, it's for a, uh, an introduction to our, our panelists that are going to join us tonight. Um, Professor Karen Laporte uh, is a graduate of the University of Miami School of Law, where she received her Juris Doctorate, cum laude. She was also elected to serve on the Executive Board of Directors for the National Native American Law Students Association. Professor Laporte worked as a law clerk to the Chief Legislative Counsel for Little River Band Ottawa Indians and as a law clerk at the United States Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. Uh, Professor Laporte has harnessed her passion for advocacy and opportunities to be involved on a U.S. Supreme Court case, develop a project presentation relating to the Indian Child Welfare Act, and developed advocacy projects relating to domestic violence and human trafficking. She's also participated in the Human Rights Advocacy Clinic, where she drafted legal memor uh, memorandums regarding the domestic implementation of the human rights framework. Professor Laporte is a descendant of the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians and is a co-founder of the Native American Global Indigenous Studies Program at the University of Miami. She is currently teaching its first course, Introduction to Native and Indigenous Peoples and Perspectives, Stories of Resistance and Resilience, which I am taking and it's an amazing class. Uh, Dagmar Koska is a diplomatic counselor and project manager overseeing climate and energy for the delegation of the European Union to the United States, managing relations between the European Union and the United States of America. Ms. Koska is a political strategist with an extensive network spanning several continents, is a former member of the cabinet of the EU Commission's Vice President, um, of the EU Commission's Vice President Mar Mar Maros Sif Sifkovic and Commissioner Gunther Altenenger, uh, with expertise in, uh, in European Union and international policy, regulatory, and competition law. Ms. Koska is an international law affairs specialist focusing on managing comp competition law affairs and dealing with external political um, affairs. Um, Eric Landsberg is a consultant on domestic and international cultural heritage digitization projects. After many years as director of imaging and visual resources at Museum of Modern Art in New York with projects spanning many developing countries, including Nigeria and Albania. At MoMA, Mr. Landsberg expanded digitization to include documentation of MoMA media and performance art, and also facilitated implementation of museum-wide digital asset management systems, and also integrated with other museum databases. In Venezuela, for example, Mr. Landsberg assisted in a project by writing a training manual for citizen photographers to document their public heritage objects that are at risk of destruction. Mr. Landsberg earned a master's, a master's of fine arts and photography at Ohio University. And so I will turn it over to my project partner, Martin. Hi guys, uh, welcome again, all of you to uh, joining us today. Really appreciate it. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the film and I hope that sparks a little bit of questions here and there. Um, so we'll, we'll jump right into the questions. Um, first off, we'll, we'll start with Dagmara because I think she has the most uh, global kind of perspective in, 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 this, uh, in this topic. So, I mean, Dagmara, uh, given the European Union uh, global leadership in combating uh, climate change, how does the European Union uh, consider its own indigenous cultures in the overall process of fighting climate change related issues. Hi everyone, uh, pleasure to be with you and uh, thanks for inviting me and for having me. Um, I uh, indeed um, am counselor at the EU delegation um, in Washington DC. Uh, these days we are working mostly virtually but that actually is an advantage is that we can reach wider audiences. So it's uh, really a pleasure to be with you uh, today and, and present um, our work. Um, I think the film resonates very strongly with, with what we are doing and thinking uh, in the European Union. And I think we see already a clear um, a link between uh, climate change and loss of culture. Um, climate change is happening today. Uh, it is not a distant threat anymore. It is really the 
uh, experience of many, many uh, regions in Europe, in the United States. And um, our approach is indeed to create more resilient uh, tomorrow for, for our societies. I would like to, from the outset, maybe make one remark. For, uh, of course, uh, in Europe, we do not have exactly the same situation when it comes to um, indigenous groups uh, for obvious historical reasons, but we still see climate change challenges, cultural heritage of many European regions. And uh, in particular, that obviously has uh, many uh, links to the economic activity in the regions. Um, for example, water shortages um, have devastating impact on um, economic activities, diverse such as um, agriculture, aquaculture, tourism, but also, um, you know, it's also an impact on food security, on um, social inequalities. Um, and of course, um, we see that jobs disappear due to either climate change or because, of course, we, are, we want to transition toward more of a healthier planet. And indeed, uh, we, I will speak about it a little in a while. Uh, Europe has very ambitious goals when it comes to uh, mid-century. So what the motto that we are um, working uh, under is to prevent the unadaptable and to adapt to the unpreventable. And I will speak about those two uh, elements. Well, first of all, prevent the unadaptable. So uh, we are really trying to race to the climate challenge. We are committed to climate neutrality by 2050. And we have a very ambitious um, reduction, emission reduction target by 2030, which is 55% compared to 1990. Um, we have already limited our emissions uh, by 23% uh, measured against 1990. Why I'm saying this? Because you're going to be in the following few days hearing a lot about those different pledges or not enough pledges. And definitely the United States is uh, about to unveil its own so-called NDC or climate target for 2030 this week. So stay tuned. I'm mentioning the, the numbers because we feel that we are really very ambitious on the European side. And our new target has been just decided in December last year. We had a lower target before that, um, but our uh, most recent one is, is really, uh, really a, a, um, a very kind of uh, recent uh, development. So we're very proud of that, of course. Um, then, of course, I'd like to say that um, uh, there's a lot I would like to now uh, talk about, uh, about the adapt to the unpreventable, because it's indeed the, the question about the cult, uh, cultural heritage, heritage that we can, we can address. So, um, number one, I think, um, how to adapt to the unpreventable. First of all, you have to recognize climate change for what it is. It is uh, a challenge. Uh, to the society and all economic sectors. And we obviously have to work toward mitigating as much as possible climate change, but we also have to recognize that we have to adapt. So we have to do a more, a more on the adaptation front. It has been one area that has been definitely forgotten or not worked on sufficiently over the past, past years. So from the European side, we have developed a adaptation strategy, which just uh, was published in February. We're very proud of, proud, proud of it. Um, and I'd like to mention one element which is uh, quite striking. Well, first of all, that we um, want to integrate considerations of climate risk into all decision-making. All decision-making of policy-making in the European Union, but also um, we hope to trigger, obviously, uh, those considerations, uh, decision making by public, uh, pub private um, entities. And if, when it comes to um, those cultural uh, groups and heritage uh, that we try to preserve, I would like to give you one example. It is how we work with coal regions in Europe. Europe still has uh, many coal regions. Um, Twelve member states ha still have. Uh, coal mining activity, and we still have a number of, I think, I, around 20 member states out of the 27 that use coal for power production. So you can tell that this is indeed a challenge for us to, to transition towards a coal-free uh, society um, uh, within a decade, maybe two, uh, but, but indeed uh, transition away from coal. 
So in those coal, uh, coal uh, mining regions, coal is definitely more than economic factor. It generally forms an important part of uh, the region's identity as well. So the prospect of phasing out coal is not only perceived as a threat to the economic prosperity, but it's also a challenge to cultural heritage and regional identity. So what the EU and also in co collaboration with EU member states um, do, we try to work with those regions to create uh, economic diversity in those regions. But part of that uh, work on projects for those uh, regions is on um, also culture, cultural heritage of that mining identity that I mentioned before. So for example, there are science centers and cultural centers that have been creating that uh, are devoted to the mining history um, and obviously um, uh, uh, educate uh, um, all society, but also create a center for tourism. And uh, there is uh, one such center in France, but there are many more in other member states. But the one in France is quite notable because um, it is uh, really has become um, a, um, a, a, a significant factor for, for tourism in that region. So clearly that center now is almost operating uh, at, at no public support and uh, creates its own revenues, which is which is very relevant, I think, for our discussion. So I would like to maybe finish um, here. I'm just saying to you that telling you also that uh, we feel uh, that we as a European Union have a, a large role to play uh, when it comes to adaptation needs uh, in other world regions. And Africa is, is uh, one region that we work very closely with. Sub-Saharan uh, uh, Africa alone, um, we uh, um, estimate that there could be 70 million people by 2050 that uh, will uh, migrate. So indeed, um, we've uh, devoted um, quite a lot of finance uh, to, to actually work with Africa to, to help those, those, those regions. So I, I think I will finish uh, and conclude here, but I think um, uh, while those adaptation challenges uh, are local specific, uh, solutions um, can often be transferable and applicable on a regional, national and transnational scale. And this is something that I would like to leave with you that, uh, that indeed uh, there could be lessons learned for, for regions. Um, and also this is part of my work to try to bring uh, colleagues together to exchange about those uh, experiences and lessons learned. Thank you. Thank you, Lagmara, for that thorough answer. Um, Jamal, you wanna take the next one for Caroline? Uh, thank you, Doug Mara, for your, your perspective. Uh, Professor Laporte, uh, can you expand on how the indigenous experience in the United States, uh, how it can be considered by American institutions that are trying to uh, engage in cultural preservation? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, I just want to say congratulations to you and Martin both. I thought it was fantastic. I think the film that you guys put together was uh, very visually pleasing, but it was also just kind of inspiring and uh, it gave me a lot to think about. So I really appreciate it. I want to congratulate you guys on doing that. Um, and thank you so much for the question, right? So um, I do believe that one way to frame a response is to think about it, right, and examine it first historically. So we have to think about how specifically in the United States cultural genocide uh, could also be a contributing factor to climate change. Uh, and I would say that most Native advocates would say it was a strong argument, right? Um, and second, we have to think about how that historical relationship, particularly one that has been always defined by settler colonialism, white supremacy, genocide, and state violence, uh, continues even to this second, right? That it's not necessarily a historical concept or that it lives primarily in the past. Um, and that conveys responsibility to all of us, right? Um, but to do that, you really have to examine the different indigenous populations experiences with colonialization, not, not try to make like a pan indigenous uh, approach to it, right? We've all, you know, the, the Eastern seaboard tribes have had a very different experience with it than the, the Western tribes had. Um, and so doing that, and obviously we don't have time to do that in five minutes, that would take like 15 years to do, right? Um, but at the very least, everybody should take um, the time and learn about and acknowledge the factual history of what has occurred in what is now America. 
Um, and so the destruction of the land that we now share limited agency with as indigenous people, uh, and I do say agency because we believe that, at least in my culture, in Anishinaabe culture, we believe that land is living um, and that it's, it, we have a relationship with land that I don't have, um, I don't have authority over it per se, right? Um, that, that that destruction is a mere continuation of massive land theft, uh, disruption and attempted eradication of our relationship to our non-human kinship uh, and including and especially to our ancestral lands. Um, and so what has to be considered, right? Which was, your, which was the crux of your connection uh, or your question. So you have to think, what does it mean to be indigenous to a place, specifically to a certain place? Uh, my ancestral land, for example, is North. Uh, it's, it's what was once Anishinaabe territory uh, and is now known as the state of Michigan. Um, and we believe that Michigan, in particular a certain place in Michigan, is where we come from. Uh, that land is where our creation stories originate. My kinship, my family's kinship, it's there. Our stories are there. Our medicine is there. Our ancestors are there. Uh, there we can find sacredness, right? I can't find that sacredness in another place as an Anishinaabe person. Uh, so we really have to consider what climate migration might mean, right, for, for North American Native people and not accept it as, as a foregone, right, which I think it's happened historically anyways, if we look at it, you know, if you look at all the different eras, for example, of federal Indian law and policy, you know, you're going to see, right, that colonization, removal and assimilation and ultimately termination of tribal sovereignty, that was very much a part of, of the United States plan to eradicate Native people. Um, so so we really, I, I think we really have to think about that, right? Like, yes, it's happened historically, but does it need to be something that continues, right? Is there, is there a way for us to say right now today, right, that, that um, indigenous people can and should occupy their ancestral lands and that, and that if they should, that it should benefit all of us and it, and it would, right? Um, so I can't be indigenous to another place. So once we no longer have access to that place, what does that mean for my identity? And I was really touched in your video because you all hit on that, right? There was this discussion from somebody who said, you know, what, what we see, right, is that um, there's like a shedding of the person, right? And what that means for them. Um, what would that mean for my identity? Uh, we also have to think about the connection with our native languages, with our songs and our ceremonies, traditional teachings, uh, teachings around water and certain places of significance. You know, those ceremonies are connected to that land, right? I can't recreate that here in South Florida. Um, and as a lawyer, you know, one of the things that I've come to appreciate is the nuance of language, right? The way that language often uh, predicates values and the way that we enforce uh, like shared societal contracts, for example. But our language, Anishinaabe, tells me that all things are inanimate, right? That, that they are alive beings. And that to me is law as well. Um, and English doesn't share that same view, right? So, so there's gonna have to also be some consideration of what would it look like to shift back, right? How would we do that? What's our responsibility to do that? Um, to give indigenous people here in North America the the space, right, that they would need to be able to reconnect in that way. And can we do it? And, and the, the, the question of can we do it really boils down to how are we gonna consider settler colonialism? How do we deal with how it's literally existed to invalidate indigenous forms of governance, indigenous existence, and specifically our governance forms that were relational rather than transactional? And in that way, uh, some of the considerations are gonna have to be, right, like collectively, what are we willing to do about it? When we all, to be very honest with you, benefit from it. We all benefit from settler colonialism, that is true. Um, so can we make a shift sort of from the individualism that comes with that towards the collective? You know, and I don't know, right? I think that, I think that um, indigenous populations in the United States are sort of in this in-between. We're in an in-between of, Genocide occurred here and it's been an ongoing occurrence, right? But it hasn't been completely successful. So in the way that we've been resilient, we've continued, right? But, but that, but us, you know, <laughs> but the genocide being successful is also key, right? To, uh, to settler colonialism um, ultimately being successful, ultimately taking control of land in that way. And so I don't know, you know, like we're just in this weird place of, um, of not knowing how to reckon with it really, right? So I think it's gonna be about thinking about how to restore indigenous stewardship of land and, and what authority and space are we willing to give up to do that? I hope that answered your question. 
Yeah. Definitely, it, it answered and then sparked uh, another question, actually. Um, I'd like to tie it back to the perspective of the European, the European Union um, and what their, I say they, I mean the European Union institutions, uh, the delegation that Doug Mara represents. Um, it kind of sparks to my mind how all of these negotiations are happening in English um, so that the American delegation can understand, right? Um, there's a global commonality of, okay, how are we all going to formulate this discussion and this dialogue? And I guess another question is, how can we ensure that the dialogue reflects the, the differences in indigenous languages? Um, how can the dialogue happening at the, um, the climate summit that's happening with President Biden and the European Union leaders, how can that language um, adopt that the land is alive, for example? You know, who, who has the, the uh, I guess, not to use the word authority, but who, who has the power to make sure that the language being used represents the, uh, the interests and the perspective of indigenous people who are the ones most affected by climate change. So I'd like to put that out there. If I, if I may just offer my perspective a little bit from the European Union, um, you know, uh, in the European Union, obviously English is, is one of the languages uh, for us, uh, which are called working languages, but we have three official working languages, German, English, and French. Um, however, all acts are being translated in all official EU languages. So basically, by doing this already, we create kind of ownership and, and the ability for all people from all EU member states, 27 member states, we have over 20 languages, EU languages, to be able to really follow um, what, what kind of the legislative agenda is, the policy making. Um, so, so all official languages are being, trans, are being used on a daily basis for all acts of the, of the European Union. And I think um, you know, that is um, a relevant experience for the United States because even though you have your own one American English uh, language, you still have those um, uh, many uh, indigenous uh, languages that um, you know, uh, may, might be difficult to, difficult to classify, but there could be ways of, of translating you know, the important documents into those languages. And therefore, by having uh, such, a, such an attempt at um, uh, you know, bringing kind of uh, into, their, into that language, uh, uh, all, let's say, the developments in, in Washington DC, you basically create a link, a, a closer link uh, from the center to the, let's say, to the, to, the, to the other regions and from that regions to the center um, because you actively are using the language, right? So that is a little bit my perspective on this. I mean, I can just add to, you know, I think, I think that there is obviously um, an idealistic sort of value right behind hearing Anishinaabe in a forum like that. Would I be able to understand it right now? You know, the truth is no, right? Um, cultural genocide in the United States um, was incredibly intentional um, and it was very protracted over a long period of time. Um, and so, you know, there were th there's success in that. I mean, we only have, I think, nine native language speakers in our tribe left. Um, and once that's gone, that's gone. Um, but what are the values that are transmitted in our tribal languages, right? Can we can we talk? Can our elders, you know, could they could they extrapolate those for us? Talk to us about what those mean? And in the interim, right, until the time that we can restore our languages, can we place, you know, the value in the value itself, right, versus in the way that we uh, relate them to? You know, to thinking about how we communicate. I think that's, you know, I think that would be a valid way to look at it too, right? It's not necessarily just speaking the language, but also thinking really like what are indigenous values um, in these spaces? And are they values that other people, right, who traditionally, like you said in your video, have taken an ethnocentric approach for, you know, one more dominant culture, but are they values that, th that the dominant culture would be willing, right, to partake in? That would be my, that's, that's, you know, that would be my question, I guess. Thank you, thank you both so much. Um, Mr. Landsberg, yeah. I have a question for you. 
Uh, thank you for, for joining us tonight. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, can you describe the different processes um, involved in digitizing the different types of artifacts a culture can produce, uh, such as dances, old traditions, stories, sculptures, et cetera? Um, can you describe how the process can differ between tangible and intangible artifacts? And, and can you center your answer um, to continue the, the theme of language? Can you use uh, language as an example? Mr. Landsberg, you're muted. There, I should be back, is that right? Good. Well, Martin and Jamal, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I've now seen your film three times. <laughs> and I, I think it's, it's terrific and uh, provocative and very thought provoking. So uh, I think you've done a fabulous job. Um, so to address that question, I think my challenge in speaking to this group is not to become overly technical. Um, and yet a certain amount of that, and when we talk about how do we digitize these various forms of culture, a certain amount of that's necessary. So stop me if I'm, if I'm drifting off entirely. But um, I would say, I think very rightly you divided into tangible and intangible culture. And, um, my personal experience is primarily with tangible culture. So mostly fine art oriented paintings, sculptures, installations, related issues, but also uh, with dance and, uh, and performance, less so with language. Um, but to, to address that, Jamal asked me to focus on language. And obviously the greatest tool we have for um, dealing with preservation of indigenous cultures and language is audio recording, right? So uh, while audio recording has existed for a very long time, um, so much of it is entirely lost and unusable uh, due to the fragility of the medium, uh, of the support media, uh, formats, not too many of us have quarter inch tape recorders available to play back some of the field recordings that were made in 1930, for instance. Um, it's a real issue. Uh, it's an issue both on the visual side and also on the audio side. Um, uh, but in a digital realm, uh, where as many people will feel like well, it's digital, so it'll last forever. We have no problem. We can keep making copies. We can keep making backups. But, but actually, in, in my view, uh, in spite of, uh, in addition to all of the advantages of the digital technology we have right now for preservation of culture, the one thing to keep in mind is that digital information is perhaps the most fragile of any form of recording we've done. Um, cuneiform, etched into stone lasts for thousands of years, right? But uh, the JPEGs you made um, five years ago may not be usable, right? The Word document that you wrote uh, in freshman year <laughs> may not be readable by senior year. Um, so it's, a, it's an enormous challenge. Um, and while I'm not as familiar with um, the approaches to solving that issue, uh, in terms of audio. Um, I'm a little bit familiar with it in terms of video, but I'm very familiar with it in terms of digital imaging. And um, whereas some of the documentation of culture uh, created when digital imaging was first used for that purpose, which is roughly, I, I find a turning point of approximately 1997 when museums and other cultural institutions began to switch from analog film over to digital imaging, many of those image files um, need to be redone. If they can be opened, if the file can be opened, the technology at the time was vastly inferior to what we have now. And um, aside from the, the most obvious, which is probably resolution and sharpness, um, the huge issue of color um, has advanced so tremendously in the last 30 years that uh, there was virtually no color control to digital imaging, um, say in mid 90s to the late 90s. So what's developed finally are a series of standards um, 
in, in Europe, there is a standard uh, named Metamorphosa. In the US, the standard is an acronym, FAGI, the Federal Agencies Digital Guidelines Initiative, uh, which actually covers both um, still imaging and time-based media. Um, and whereas there had been these two different standards, and we all know that phrase, I think the wonderful thing about standards is there's so many to choose from, right? But those have both been integrated into an ISO standard now. So now there is an international standard of measurable quality and best practices to which museums and other cultural institutions can conform. Um, and that's been adopted by most major museums. So just as a little bit of background there in terms of the data itself, um, we've, also got, we've also got methods now of monitoring what's referred to as bit rot, which um, as a digital filmmaker, Martin, I know that you're, you're very aware of, perhaps not everyone is, but um, in a, no matter how many backup copies we might have, of our important files, many of which in terms of cultural heritage cannot be recreated. Um, there is a, an, an issue of what's called bit rot, which is that the data itself becomes unreadable for various reasons. Um, many various regions, including some that are environmental, um, including magnetic issues, um, earthquakes, uh, so, ma so many things, floods, earthquakes, all kinds of natural disasters. So there are now methods for ensuring that that digital data does not get lost, uh, for archiving it properly, um, and maintaining its usefulness over decades, right? Um, what's critical in terms, so these are our, we have our images, we have our audio documentation, but what's equally important is the metadata that's associated with those images, right? So metadata for Anyone who's not familiar with that term is usually referred to as data about data, right? So we have a photograph, let's say a wonderfully made digital image of rock art in the Southwest, right? Um, but if that comes up on someone's screen without an adequate description of what we're looking at, and I'm not talking about the technical description, te technical metadata, but actual um, object related metadata. What does that rock art represent? Who told us what that rock art represents? Perhaps most importantly, what's the source of the interpretation? Um, where was it found? When was it found? Um, getting the metadata right is the most important thing. And I would argue that it's more important than the image quality itself is a description of what that metadata represents. So in my mind, um, it's critical whenever we're documenting uh, indigenous cultures, cultures at risk due to climate change, that the community that created the objects is the community that is telling the story. And too often throughout history, as we all know, that has not been the case. Um, and at the moment, the most obvious example of that for me are the Benin bronzes from Nigeria, where I've done some work, um, which are uh, at, at present European museums, primarily not so much from the US museums, are negotiating with Nigerian cultural institutions to return much of that. But up until now, the story of these Benin bronzes has been told by the British Museum, primarily uh, several German museums. So that metadata, that description or storytelling is highly suspect. Um, I see the return of the Benin bronzes as uh, one of the best developments um, in the last couple of years in terms of colonial culture and theft and looting of those, those cultures that have been dominated. Um, uh, in terms of getting the work done, um, I've been involved in several projects where the easiest thing to do is to come up with funding. Well, that's not the easiest thing to do, but once, once we have funding, <laughs> the easiest thing to do is to call in a band of experts to do the work, right? And then take the digital files with them. And then they go into some institution somewhere, right? Who then determines what kind of access is gonna be provided, right? 
I think that model is, um, first of all, it's highly suspect. I think finally people are coming around to realize that it is disempowering to the culture that's being documented when that approach is taken. So the approach I prefer, and a lot of my colleagues agree with, is that ideally we build capacity within the culture to document their own culture. And we make decisions about how those images and that audio is going to be shared. Those decisions are made by the culture, right? So um, while it's tremend tremendous advantage that we can share cultural information worldwide through various aggregators, uh, Google Arts and Culture, uh, any number of any number of organizations, there are objects and processes and ceremonies and stories that perhaps shouldn't be shared because they, uh, I don't know this firsthand, uh, Caroline could address this much better than I could, but um, I know we're on the same page here that um, in the sharing of that digital data, the object loses its power. And so a real conundrum is we wanna preserve we want to educate, we want to make resources available to scholars and casual learners. But at the same time, part of the challenge is not destroying the meaning of the object by documenting it. So it's it's the Heisenberg principle that applies in, in all fields. So that's one of the greatest challenges right now. Um, and the other is building capacity within the community. So a number of the projects I've been involved with, um, Jamal mentioned the one in Venezuela. So in Venezuela, uh, I was involved in a project organized by a nonprofit in California called the ARC Project, who became very aware that a lot of the public sculpture in Venezuela is deteriorating for two reasons. First, uh, the finances haven't been there to maintain these public sculptures. And second, the economy is so destroyed that in desperation, people will go out and at night with cutting torches and cut off the bronze because bronze has material value, whereas the currency does not. And so the way we approached that was to write training manuals and provide equipment for Venezuelan citizens to go out into public areas, determine what the most important objects are to be documented and to do that documentation. Um, and then to support the storage of that documentation, the nonprofit in California has provided that service. Um, what's interesting about that project though, is it's three dimensional objects that are primarily being documented, both the built environment and also public sculpture. It's being documented in 3D. So whereas uh, when, we when we talk about documenting material culture, um, the first thing that comes to mind are photographs of various sorts, whether they're 19th century daguerreotypes or 21st century digital images, two-dimensional images of three-dimensional objects. More and more, we're starting to document in three dimensions. And so what that involves is um, several different techniques. I'll just throw the names out because you may wish to look into them. One of them is laser scanning. Laser scanning is very expensive. The equipment itself is usually out of reach for projects that involve indigenous communities. Um, but another one is called photogrammetry and the name is not so important, but the thing about photogrammetry is it can create, ordinary citizens can use commonplace cameras, nothing special, no $50,000 equipment, right? $800 cameras that can be purchased used, right? Um, can use standard cameras to create scientifically accurate three-dimensional descriptions of physical objects. And um, that's, an that's a really exciting development. And one of the primary organizations um, doing that kind of training is both the ARC Project in Los Angeles and an organization, another nonprofit called Cultural Heritage Imaging out of San Francisco and also known as Chi. Uh, and Chi has done trainings worldwide um, to teach people how to use standard cameras 
to create three-dimensional description, three-dimensional digital models, right? That can be rotated and zoomed in any, di any direction with accurate color and importantly for scholarship, accurate dimensions. And what that would allow, so what the accurate dimensions would allow is any researcher, uh, let's take the Benin bronzes just as an example, which have been dispersed from their homeland they're in Germany, they're in the UK, they're in the United States. But with photogrammetry, a scholar can bring up two images on the screen and can take accurate measurements down to fractions of a millimeter uh, of the object. So if, in other words, if you say, I wanna know how wide that eye is in a sculpture, it can be measured from this accurate digital model and it can be compared with another one that might be in Germany or it might be in Tokyo. Um, so the kind of study of culture is enhanced and enabled by that kind of technology. But what's critical there is these images are made by citizen photographers. They're not necessarily made by, by trained professionals. So I see that as a very positive direction uh, for things to go in. Um, and then related to all of this, course is the archiving of, the, of this digital documentation. So we have digital audio, digital video, digital 2D images, digital 3D images. That is a challenge um, that I don't have a good solution for in terms of indigenous cultures because it's expensive and it requires lots of equipment and constant investment. And so there, I see a challenge right there because we need to, if the indigenous culture is controlling the story, but the data itself is housed by a large university saying, it's critical and perhaps University of Miami, it seems like it's very sensitive to this issue. Um, it's critical to put the agency in, in the hands of the culture, even though the technology for preservation is being provided by a larger institution. And right now I see that as a big challenge because it's, it's not the nature of large institutions to think of these kinds of issues. And they don't actually, it's not part of what happens at the monthly meeting, you know? It's just not built into the corporate or university culture to do that. So that getting that intersection working, I see right now as the biggest challenge. Um, I'd be happy to answer any other questions that might relate to any of this. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, that was, that was amazing. amazing. Okay. A lot of points touched. Um, we're out of time, unfortunately. I mean, this is sort of the thoughts that are so complex that it takes, it takes years to figure out, right? So, I mean, within an hour, we, we, we kind of hope to, you know, ask more questions and answer them. But, you know, we touched on the mining regions in, in the European Union and how they're dealing with that. We talked about the linguistic mistranslations with, with Caroline, uh, with artifacts and rituals. And, you know, we talked with uh, Eric about things that we shouldn't uh, digitize or shouldn't try to preserve such as dances or more intimate forms of uh, culture. So I think, I think a lot was learned today. A lot of great questions and you know hopefully some of these um some solutions might you know pop in the in the darkness as i would say um so uh, jamal if you have any remarks to finish it off uh sure so the recording will be available on miami.edu slash earth week and um i think we'll have the contact information for the panelists um up on the the sustainability U website I want to thank you, the panelists, so much uh, for participating. Your your perspective is is uh, without without end, and um, I really really appreciate it. Uh, to the audience who tuned in to watch the film and to watch the discussion, thank you for your energy. Uh, we, we we felt it, and um, just want to say good night to everybody and happy Earth Week. Thanks, Jamal. Happy Earth Week, uh, everyone. Just to, uh, to uh, a little segue, because just a coincidence, but at seven, oh, yes. right now, I'm going to put that in the in the chat, actually. At seven, we have Reverend Cypress, uh, Houston Cypress from the Seminole tribe. It's going to be uh, talking about Love the Everglades, the movement he founded uh, several years ago.
So if you want to learn about conservation and uh, indigenous culture in, uh, in, in Miami, tune in 7 p.m. I'm, I'm sharing the, the Zoom link. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you for Thank the you opportunity. Bye-bye. I know. <laughs>